Well, good evening. It's, it's a privilege to stand here. It's an honor to serve you guys. Um, I make a lot of jokes. Hope you can stick with me. I'm a stand-up comedian, so I make jokes, right? But, but this evening, standing there singing all the songs was so great. Singing about God's name, singing about his goodness, singing about how faithful he is. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking to myself, hey, amen, every song has a line of my sermon. And the more I, I sing, the more I get emotional. My heart starts pumping because I'm in the right place. Amen. I've got a good introduction. At least they said I'm a sinner saved by grace. I, I preach now and then. That's good, right? But this evening, I want to I wanna set us up with something like this, saying that um, many people place value on something. You have to place value on something for it to be valuable. Right? So, for example, when gold comes out of the fire, it gets a, a guy stamping it there saying, this shiny metal is 18 carat, and he puts a certificate there and it gets value. Right? That's how it gets value, if I'm correct. So we place value on a lot of things, some higher than others. Right? And for me, I've been studying and looking at what we place value on in the 21st century, and what we place value on is Houses, cars, jobs, vacations. Vacations, eh? Yep. Hashtag vacation. <laughs> right? And we want to see a lot of places. And the value we place on that sometimes has more value than what we place on the kingdom of God. Because I'll go to the ends of the earth and I'll sacrifice as much as I can to get there. Right? But when we come to the things of God, the value is a bit less. Because it's just another church service. It's just another song. It's just another sermon. It's just chilling with people for another two hours and I get to go back and place value on my vacation, my house, my car, my job. Think about it. Right? So we all place value on something. Let's look at houses. What do we sacrifice to live in certain estates or in certain areas? What is it we sacrifice? Man, I'll have a conversation with my wife and I'll be like, Ibotsi looks good. You know, are we from the east of Benoni. So, yeah, so, so all we have in the east is Ibotsi. Right? You can Google it. Right? And we spoke and I'm like, Ibotsi will be good, man. Nice place for my son to grow up. He can ride his bike and, and, and all these things. It's safe in there. And then you search and you're like, five million. Lord, I'm a pastor. <laughs> right? My salary doesn't equate to five million. But I'm willing to sacrifice to get there because I place a high value on security. Right? So if that's true, we then buy a couple of houses, maybe for us who has enough money to buy houses, and we use them as rental properties to make more money. We place value on that, right? And then all of a sudden, my beach house becomes a reality. It's value. I have a value on property. So I'm going to invest my time, my effort, my funds, my family. I'm going to sacrifice, right? Because I place value on a house. For us who enjoy cars, you place value on cars in terms of growing up, we used to stick our cars on the walls, right? I don't know if younger people know how that functions, <laughs> right? But we'd stick the car on the wall. And, and, and as you stick the car on the wall, you're like, one day is one day. Right, that time you don't understand the value or the payments or whatever it is, you're just like, that's the one. For me, it was always the M3, right? It was always on the wall. It was a dream, and then the dream changed, right? <laughs> but, but what happens with this is we sacrifice to get there. That dream car, I want to drive it. And the moment you drive it, ah, it's just another car. I'm looking for the next one. Exactly, right? And what happens from there is for us who love collectibles, we collect, and the garages are full. And I place value on that. And it's just there. 
I drive one of them once every three months, but it's just value. I value cars, so I sacrifice. And the sacrifice I put in is that there must be fuel in all those cars. I must be able to pay the bill for all those cars. The tires must change. I need enough garage space. So it, it just happens that you only use one car, but those ones come out on Sundays and the occasional drive when I can drop the top. Unfortunately, we live in Joburg. It's hot. <laughs> so when you drop the top on the highway, man, you're burning. <laughs> but a convertible is a nice thing to own, but I'm burning. <laughs> man, even having a sunroof is an issue. You have a nice panoramic roof, but the visor is always closed. Because you know those thighs burn. <laughs> right? But it's what we sacrifice, we place value there. Then we place value on vacations because of Instagram. Instagram and TikTok. Those influencers on TikTok make Cape Town look great. Hmm? They make Rome and all these places look phenomenal. And then it's an old video that just resurfaced. Right? But we look at this and we're like, you know, I want to be the first one in my family to get the passport stamped. I want to be the first one to travel the world. I want to see these six countries and our currency doesn't allow for that. But I want to see these six countries. Right? And as we want to see these six countries and all this... My salary doesn't equate to these six countries, but I'll get a credit card so I can get there because I place value on vacations. You see how far we're willing to sacrifice because we place value on something. Right? So we don't care about the debt that we incur because I had a blast. The gram is going to buzz. Man, I'm going to get likes and the dopamines in my mind is going to go off because my phone is ringing at every moment. <laughs> did you go there for the likes or did you go there because it's a dream? We place value on these things and we sacrifice that when we come back for three years, I'm still paying off Europe. <laughs> and then work. We chase the corner office. The one with the view. I don't know how tall your buildings are. Mine is one story. <laughs> I don't got no corner office and the view of my office is the parking lot. <laughs> so I don't know what I aspired to do. But when we're chasing the dream job, in order to reach that goal, we sacrifice family. Because certain times, work comes first. It's a nice family dinner, but I'm sending an email. We on this lovely vacation that we sacrificed for, but I'm always on a conference call. I'm always sending an email. I'm always doing something because if I don't, I ain't getting that promotion. And if I don't get that promotion, I'm not getting that job. And the dream is further away. I place value on that and I pay the price in terms of family time. I've heard stories after stories of people who will be like, if only I could go back. I could spend more time with my son or my daughter, and I could see them play sport, and I could see them thrive. Unfortunately, I was making the money, is our excuse, I was making the money to bankroll that dream, but I wasn't present. That's the sacrifices we want to pay. We're willing to pay for those things. And if we think about it, it leads nicely into a title. I love titles. I know you don't, but I love them. Because <laughs> I get to think if I have some creativity. And the one I have this evening is the immeasurable value of the kingdom. It doesn't measure to anything. The job, the vacation, the cars, the homes, the kingdom is more valuable. But we don't place value on this because who's going to see it? Who's going to like it? Who's going to tweet about what I've achieved? Right? Okay. That's why we don't place value on the kingdom because no one sees it. The Bible says it's no eye has seen, no ear has heard. So the question is, are you willing to pay the price for what you place value on or are you willing to pay the price for what Jesus places value on? 
That's what we need to, we need to think through this whole sermon. If you want to stick with me, if you want to leave now, that's fine. But when you leave here, just leave asking yourself, am I willing to pay the price for my own dreams? Am I willing to ride the journey with Jesus for his kingdom and his glory? So now, growing up, we used to play a crazy game. And this game we used to play was called, if your house was on fire, what would you go in and get? Right, I had mad friends. I don't know why they played games like that. <laughs> but I, back in the day, I always used to picture our house burning. And I'd be like, what am I going to take? My PlayStation. Right? There's the most value to me. I place value on that. And I'd go in, risk my life to grab my PlayStation and come out. And then as I grew older, material things just never mattered to me anymore. Either I have it or I don't. It's fine. But for some of us here this evening, if your house is on fire right now, what's the one thing you go in to grab? Don't say it out loud. <laughs> just don't do that. Right? It's a safe space, but not that safe. What is it you're going to grab? And the one thing you're going to grab, you can convince me, otherwise I believe that's your idol. Because that's what you place value on more than God. And I can guarantee you as much as we, a church gathered here, we're not running to save a Bible. Amen? Right, so we're not running there. So we've already established None of us is going in. Hey, that CSB or ESV was gifted to me by so-and-so. There's value on that. I need that. None of us are doing that. Or is it just me? Right? That's, that's where it's at. So now I know we're not going to run for something God places value on. We're going to run for something we place value on. Right? So what is it we place value on is valuable to us? With all of that in mind, you understand that we're going to speak of the value of the kingdom of God. So i kind of done a good job. Good introduction, right? So let's all track together, open our Bibles, and we'll read Matthew 13, verse 44. And it's, it's a very interesting story. Because a parable is a story and Jesus is relaying a message to his people in language they understand. Similar to us, we love stories. Since you were a child, your parents probably read you a bedtime story and so you would think that's how the world looks like as we play on. So just imagine this is one of those stories that's just being told in a way we can understand. And the passage would read, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Mm -hmm. So if we break it down, we see that there's the kingdom of heaven, which means there's another kingdom. You can't just have one kingdom. There has to be opposition. So if we have the kingdom of heaven, I'm not even going to say the kingdom of darkness. I'm going to say the kingdom of me against the kingdom of heaven. Right? So, so if the kingdom of me is where I place value above Jesus, that is his opposition. It's what he needs to destroy. He needs to destroy the kingdom of me. Right? So the kingdom of me lives in the kingdom of darkness. And then we have the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God will define it as the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is used interchangeably. So if I switch, just know it's the same thing. But we'll define it as I believe every kingdom has a king, yeah. right? So if every kingdom has a king, the king of the kingdom of heaven is God. Yes. Psalm 24 and verse 1 will say, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. It says that's the earth, the fullness thereof, that's my kingdom. That's my reign, that's my dominion, that's where I live. Some guys will go further and say the dominion is or where God's kingdom is, is your heart. If you belong to him, that's where your kingdom is. That's where his kingdom is, right? So if that's his kingdom, and my kingdom of me can never be this big. My kingdom can never be this big. The earth 
the fullness thereof. It, it shows who's sovereign. I'm not, he is. So that's how he's smashing. Right? So he's showing you that my kingdom has more value than yours because I created it. Your kingdom is one I created for you to exist in. So with you existing in that kingdom, God still reigns over that one. But if not, you're saying, Lord, my hand is a bit more powerful than yours, so I'm going to smash you. Impossible. Right? So if the kingdom of heaven is the domain ruled by God as sovereign king, that's what we're speaking about. That's where there's value. He placed value on his own kingdom. He backs himself. The same way we back ourselves in placing value on what we place value on, he says, all those things I created, yet you place more value on that than you place on me. You see, the verse goes further and it says he's like a treasure. Man, all of us love treasure. It's not a treasure, it's not a treasure that's just described there as we dig in somewhere and we find treasure. I see none of us digging, right? But what this treasure would symbolize is more a valuable thing. They placed value on their belongings, right? So with them placing value on their belongings, what they are saying is this treasure is better than that. So when Jesus tells the story, he says, let me use things you understand. You understand treasure. You understand that when people are rich, they don't have safety deposit boxes or banks to go deposit their money in back in this time. So what they do is in their piece of land, they dig it up and they put it down there. Right? And sometimes some of these guys are so wealthy that they forget where they put these things. I like those guys. Right? <laughs> but they forgot where they placed this treasure. It's valuable. But if you're digging all over to hide stuff, man, you need a good GPS or something to, to locate where all those things are. Right? So this story says this treasure is valuable. Everybody listening to Jesus at this time knows exactly what he's speaking about. He's speaking about something we all want. Right? And I, I imagine a pirate ship. I always do when it comes to treasure. And I imagine a lot of gold coins in there. And we've buried this underground. And now the passage says, this man, by accident, finds it. He finds this treasure by accident. But what he does is, is interesting. He finds it, he sees it, he covers it up again. Many people will say, hey, that is unethical. You should take out the treasure. But he knows, according to the Jewish law, if he takes that out, it belongs to the owner of the field. But if he leaves it there, it's his. Touch black, you can't get it back. <laughs> right? It's one of those. And it's there. He leaves it there. And he says, okay, I've seen the treasure. It's valuable. I found this thing by accident. If I found it by accident, no one knows it's there. And because no one knows it's there, I might as well go home and see what I can do. Tomorrow I'll come and fetch it again. But he can't pull it out. Because the moment he pulls it out, he's not the owner of the field. It's going to belong to the owner of that field. So he says, let me leave it there. And we need to think about this. And we need to think really hard. What are the odds of us digging up treasure? Tata my chance, anybody, man. What are the odds of us with no location, not knowing that there's treasure here? What are the odds of us just digging it up? Thousand lifetimes, maybe? Maybe more, right? D.A. Carson says it like this, and he says, finding the treasure appears to be by chance in a land as frequently ravaged as Palestine. Many people doubtlessly bury their treasures, but to actually find a treasure would happen once in a thousand lifetimes. So this guy is the one <laughs> in a thousand lifetimes. He finds this. He says, let me cover it up. Let me go. We don't know. Many commentators describe this man as poor. He's a laborer in the field, right? So he leaves there, 
He goes home, he has great joy because he's found this treasure. It's valuable. And as he finds this treasure, he goes home and he says, with joy in my heart, everything I own doesn't match up to that. We don't know if he's counted all the coins in there. He doesn't have time because he's not pulled it out. He's just seen the, the surface. He's not dug deep yet. We don't know what's in this treasure box. We don't know how big it is. We don't know how small it is. Could be one of those small ones where you put your earrings in and, and, and those things. It's not really small. It's actually, yeah, those ones are big. I've seen them. They're massive. <laughs> right? But I've been thinking about this for some time. This guy never saw what's there because he never pulled, pulled it out. He just saw something and he said, that's good. And because it's good, I'm going to go sell all my dreams. Everything I place value on, I'm going to sell for something I just saw at the top. I just saw the surface. And I think that's more valuable than everything I own. So let me sell that and then come and buy the land. He didn't buy his salvation. He bought the field. He saw the treasure. And he's like, this is everything. As believers in Jesus Christ, if he is our treasure, he's everything. Whether I'm still praying for the car and he's not answering, he's everything. Whether I'm praying for the house and he's not answering, he's everything. This guy saw the surface, a glimmer of hope. And he says, everything I own can go. Because that glimmer of hope is all I want. A little taste of Jesus. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That's all he saw. And he says, what I saw is more than enough. Amen. And I place my dreams and all my other possessions that I own on the market. And in South Africa, with the interest rate and all this, that market's going to take a long time. It's going to take a very long time for my possessions to sell, to buy that field. And if I'm that man, I'm starting to scratch my head and say, hey, another buyer, another buyer, another buyer. No, there's no other buyer. He is the buyer. Because he, he finds that treasure. He finds that hope. And when he finds that hope, he says, everything I own, Lord, is not as big as what you are. And if you are this big, I'll sell all these things to live in your kingdom. What value do we place on the things of God? Man, this man found the treasure, he went to sell everything, says that's total commitment. It's not half-hearted. It's not I'm in only Sundays and I'm out for the rest of the week. Six days is mine, one is yours. This is Lord, seven days are yours. I've seen that glimmer. I know you can do it. I believe Elevation Worship has a song that says, I see you move, you move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. Right, so with that said, is this man says, I've seen that. I'm all in, one time. Take the dreams, take the cars, take the house, take the vacation, take everything. Lord, your glory is more than that. That's where his value lies. And he says, I'm all in. I always think of the day when all of us meet Jesus, right? Not heaven, the first time we, we actually encountered him to cross the line of faith. We had so much zeal. You remember that day? You were on fire to tell everybody about Jesus. You placed value there because this was great. And then the longer we stay in the game, we start speaking the language, we start singing the songs, we start giving a couple of rants, we see that this is, well, this is comfortable. This is good. And then your pastor stands up and says, we need to plant another three churches, and you're like, that's bad. <laughs> that's bad because it's going to cost me. Who does he think he is? This is good. We got nice space, we got music. What more? There's value on the kingdom. And the moment you see value on the kingdom, 
all these other things we have, it's nothing. Because they don't match to what God can do. This guy realizes that. And he says, I've seen the surface. In seeing the surface, I want more. And the only way I can get more is to own the field. We need to think about it. Land is expensive. Let's use our country. Land is expensive, right? This guy is poor. He sells his possessions to buy this land. The Bible doesn't say how much he paid. Right? But it does show that he's wholeheartedly committed to a mission that's going forward. He's wholeheartedly in that he says, all I have belongs to you. Never mind, other people can take it. Because I found you. Then all of a sudden he says, that's the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He can say that now because he found that treasure. Can we say that this, this evening? Can we say the Lord is my shepherd? CSB says, I have what I need. I love that. Because it, it humbles me and keeps me content. Because what I don't have is not what he wants me to have. I have what I need. This guy, I just need that little treasure. That's all I want. Because that's hope. And that's all. I don't need more. So he has what he needs to buy that land. He buys the land. And when he buys the land, the treasure is his. So now he can pull it all out. The Bible doesn't say he pulled out the treasure. I read into it. <laughs> and I imagine if I'm that guy, I want to see what's there. And the only way to see what's there is to understand who God is more and more. I need to dig deeper into who he is. I need to dig. I need to read. And I'm not saying don't read other material, but let's start with the word. Then move out to others. But for some of us, it starts with the Puritans and whoever and whoever and whoever, and then come to God's word to see if it says what those guys are saying. Let's start with the source and then add sources. Right? But let's start with the main guy. And to know him, I need to dig. This guy saw the surface and he digs because the kingdom of God has more value to him. That's where that story is, man. He goes wholeheartedly in. And if you think about it, there was a guy like this in the Bible. His name's Paul. His name was first Saul. Saul went about killing people who said Jesus is Lord. He smashed them. It was like a 300 movie in my mind. Right? And it was a bloodbath. And then on his way to Damascus, he has this vision, right? Jesus appears, Acts chapter 9. Why are you hurting me? And then he gets there, he's blind, and the word of the Lord says a man will come. And Barnabas comes, eh? Hey, God always fulfills his word. He doesn't leave you hanging. He comes through. That's the treasure that guy found. He's a God that comes through on his time. So Paul goes forward and we fast forward. He's gone on mission journeys. He's done marvelous things. He comes back and he's in Philippi. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, in verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss. Because before this, Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. On the eighth day. I'm more Jew than you are. I sat at the feet. Man, Paul is boasting at this time. This is where Paul flexed. Right? We flex sometimes. I, I, I work here. I look after these people. So and so is my client. I know this guy by name. It's a flex, eh? Right? So think about it. Paul is flexing to the people there. And he says, I got circumcised on the eighth day. Man, the greatest tutor of all time is who I sat at. I was at the best university ever. Right? And that's what he's saying. And he says, indeed, I count all of that loss. All of that. I count loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. 
See, the man who found that treasure, he also says, I count it all loss because I found God. So for us here this evening who follow God and who is feeling this thing of I'm searching for something, there's more to life than what I have, there's a cost to pay. And the cost to pay is, Lord, I count everything loss because you are everything. The kingdom of heaven is worth any sacrifice to secure. Worth anything. There's nothing you can lay on the altar that's bigger than God. Nothing. Now we can't just end there because there's another passage. They go hand in hand. It's a twin passage, right? So the twin of this would say it like this, and D.A. Carson says it like this, and says, Jesus often doesn't, Jesus often does this in his teaching. He pairs two illustrations, each with the individual emphasis to make the same general point. Yes. It's like when you repeat the chorus in a song. Yes. We're driving the point home, yeah. right? When you go back to the bridge, because you get to build the song up again, yes. you're driving it home. When a pastor repeats the same quote, he's driving a point home. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> similar. He says, let me give you two stories to drive home one main point. And he done this earlier in Matthew. He does it with the mustard seed and the leavened bread. Right? And now he does it with treasure and pearls. Because pearls was the most valuable thing in the East. But let's read Matthew 13, 45 and 46. And it says, again, there's the repeat. These two go together. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. You see the main point, the emphasis is on when I find Jesus, everything else is meaningless. You see the first parable, the man stumbles across the treasure. The second one, the merchant is seeking for it. He's seeking. So for some of us, we accidentally stumbled into this place. For others, we came into this place seeking more. Right? So this passage speaks to two people. It speaks to the one who accidentally finds his, himself or herself in this place to hear this word. And for others, it's, I'm seeking more because everything I have doesn't satisfy. Yeah. Then there's a verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. In Ecclesiastes 3 and 11. It speaks about he's created, <laughs> he's created everything. He made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. That tells you that only one thing can satisfy. Eternity satisfies eternity. You can't leave it at, I'm looking at money, I'm looking at houses, I'm looking at cars, I'm looking at whatever it is you're looking at. It's not going to satisfy because we're going to get on that hamster wheel again and keep running. Because I guarantee you the... M3 or the GTI or the Range Rover or whatever it is we love, next year there's a new one. With a hundred thousand extra for two lights. <laughs> Everything's the same, the features are the same, nothing's changed. Two lights and a 22 inch or something, right? And I drive that thing for six months and they start saying another one is in the making. It's the same with your phones. I need to have the latest Samsung. I need to have the latest iPhone. Man, keeping up is bad. Because September, iPhone 16 will come. Next year, September, iPhone 17 will come. And as it comes, a new MacBook will come out, a new iMac will come out, a new watch will come out, and probably one day a car will come out. <laughs> right? And will come out every year. It's September now, we all know it's September. Everybody who loves Apple is waiting for Tim Cook to hit the stage and tell us what an amazing phone this is. Same features, different iOS. <laughs> That's it. Added that the camera is enhanced, that you can zoom to the moon and all these things. That's all, right? But hey man, that phone sounds great. Take my 30,000 right now. Because I place value on that product, yeah. right? So if God has placed eternity in man's heart, the only thing that can satisfy is the creator. Come on. Come 
because he's placed that void in you so that when you accidentally come in and get a glimmer of that treasure, you're like, that's eternity. That satisfies my soul. That's speaking to me right now, right? And then all of a sudden you get these butterflies in your stomach. No, no, it's the conscience telling you it's time to respond because you've seen me. You've heard about me. Yes. You've sang about yes. me. That's accidentally coming in, right? Uh-huh. Now, what happens when I seek him? I, I think it's Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. We love 11, but read down. And when you read down, it says, if you seek me with your whole heart, you find me. I'm there. That's who he is. He's saying, I'm there. Just seek me. Right, so if Jeremiah says that, yo, Jesus isn't even on the scene yet. Jeremiah says, if you seek this, you'll find it. God's not playing hide and seek, saying, come when I call you. I, I'm, he's there. And if he's there, he's saying, I am more valuable than anything you own. I'm the only one that satisfies. Right? So, the merchant goes on this journey. And what we need to understand is pearls were especially valuable in the Near East. George Knight says it was in more demand than gold. So if pearls are in, more de- in a higher demand than gold, clearly this merchant knows something. Right? The story says he's a, a pearl collector. Right? And as he's a pearl collector, he knows what he's looking for. Right? So he knows exactly what has value? Think about it, guys. When we got engaged, yo, it cost us arms and legs. Yep. Yep. Right? <laughs> I can testify. It cost an arm and a leg to get engaged. And I learned about diamonds and cuts and what's clear and what's yellow. Stay away from yellow. <laughs> Come to what's clearer. Then they tell you S1 and S2. And you're like, hey, man, just tell me what's the price. <laughs> Get me as close as possible, even if you could just cut the glass, they won't know the difference. Just put it in something nice and lay it on. So this merchant is like that. He's saying, that's S1 quality, that's S2, ah, that one's a bit yellow, stay away from that. That's what, this is the guy who's seeking. So clearly he has an understanding of what he's looking for, which means he already tasted and saw, now he wants more. You don't seek something if you don't want more or you've not tasted or anything. For some of us, we go to nice restaurants and enjoy fine dining because we've tasted, seen, and perhaps posted. And we enjoy a good steak and we start comparing, ah, this restaurant steak and this one is different. It's the same cow. <laughs> same piece of meat. Just this chef has a better touch. That's the merchant. His palate is refined. He knows what he's looking for. Right? So as he knows what he's looking for, he scatters. And he searches. And he's going high, wide, deep. He's looking. He's probably with that magnifying glass looking. And he's there. A pearl of great price could obviously set up this merchant for life. Knowing pearls, this merchant searched earnestly for one of great value. What he's saying is the pearls he has is not of great value. Even though he's in an in, in a era where pearls are of great value. He says, these I have is not valuable. The one I look for has more value than anything I own. That's what the merchant is saying. Right? And he goes looking, 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 looking. And the passage says, he finds what he was searching for. Right? The merchant's life has been bound up with the pursuit of, the merchant's life has been bound up with pursuing the most precious earthly objects. Now he comes to the singular pearl. He had plural. Many, and he's coming for one. Anybody will sell or everything else for one pearl. Let's be realistic now. I've got pearls here to the value of millions, right? And I'm searching for one pearl that has greater value than what I own. 
That's what the merchant says. And he gets on this journey and he says, he finds that bull. The passage does say that, right? And when he finds this one supremely precious pearl, one single pearl of exceedingly great value, so great in fact, so precious, that he also says, take all my pearls. Now the market is open, and I'm thinking like, ah, this guy even sold it under value because he, he, he gets this great pearl he's been searching for. And when he finds this, he's satisfied. He's fulfilled. Because eternity has met the longing of his heart. As much as we're searching, what are we searching for? Yeah. Because the Bible says eternity is placed in our heart. And if eternity is placed in our heart, we're always going to be searching for something. Yeah. Always. Right? So if we're always searching for something, this evening, let me tell you, the one you are searching for is of great value. The one you are searching for is the one who changes it all. And this guy and the guy before that have one thing in common. And the one thing they have in common is when we found the treasure or when we found the pearl, we went back, sold everything to possess this one that is greater than everything. So they are both totally committed to God. They are like, there's nothing greater than this. See, the one just saw the surface of the treasure. The other one went with a, gla with a magnifying glass, searching. Searching to see if this pearl has value. And he finds that pearl. And he says, hey amen, all those other pearls, they're nothing to this one. This evening, what is the pearl that has more value than God? What is the treasure that has more value than God? And if I give you one more story from the Bible, there was a lady in John chapter 12 and verse 3. Her name was Mary, right? And this story is an interesting one because the guys who were with Jesus, they were unhappy when she done what she done, right? Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive anointing ointment. Thanks. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. That must be embarrassing. Right? The house was filled with this fragrance of perfume. Mary took savage and placed it. I'm, I'm just bringing it to our time. Mary took Tom Ford and put it on Jesus' feet. And as she put it there, she never thought what Savage cost, what Tom Ford cost. She just saw, that's the pearl. That's the treasure. That's who deserves it all. This is my life savings, but Lord, it's yours. Because you deserve that. And she breaks that. And the nice thing is, there's an aroma in the house. There's a fragrance. And now there's a smell. And then there's a Judah saying, do you know what we could do with that? Do you know that we, we could feed so many people? No, that's the excuse of saying, I found the pearl. I found the treasure. But I don't want to give you everything. That's the excuse there. And for some of us there, maybe we are like Judas in that room. And we say, I found you, Lord. Let her do that. As for me and my possessions, here we are. You can get 10% of me, 5% of me at times, and sometimes when the church gets crazy, zero. Because that's just not what I want to be a part of. Because it's asking me for more. But it's... The, the thing is not the more the church is asking or any of those things. The thing is, I value these things more than I value what God wants to achieve in our lifetimes. I, I just don't tap into that. I'm just tapping into my own retirement fund, two pot. That's where I'm at. <laughs> right? Th that's where I'm at. And as long as I can draw from that two pot, life is good. But Lord, I, I ain't going to give of this because Sahas already took and my financial advisor took. But oh Lord, I, I, 
I just don't think you need this. You're the owner of everything. That's Judas. That's what Judas is saying in that room. He's saying, hey man, listen here. You know what we could do with that? Think about it. We say that. You know, my wife and I, we always made this joke. I shouldn't say this because it's going to be on YouTube. But we always made this joke, and the joke we made is what we give could pay the installment of certain cars we would love to have. Right? But when reality kicks in, we're like, but you know what? It's still little compared to what God does. It's, it's, we just can't outgive him. And he says, you found the pearl, you found the treasure, you satisfied. Because you found what's most valuable. We're always going to be looking, we're always going to be searching, and we'll find it. Because the word says, if you seek me with your whole heart, that's key. Not seek me a little bit here and there, because times are tough, I pray a little. And when I want something else, I pray a little more. And then I start coming to the church and saying, Pastor, the Lord ain't here in my prayers. I can't find him. Seek me with everything. And I'm there. Because nothing can stand in my way. So if you seek me with everything, you find me. So all those idols we have, we're not seeking God wholeheartedly. Because we have something before God that satisfies I have a friend who always says, if I need a plumber, I need a mechanic, I need whatever I call him, because he knows a guy. But this, this evening, I want to tell you, I know a guy. I've always wanted to say that statement. I know a guy. And the guy I know is the one who satisfies everything we're looking for. Everything. So this evening, as we come in here, tomorrow evening, Sunday, the next Sunday, the Sunday after that, the midweek stuff, whatever it is we're looking for, we don't go there for the vibes. We don't go there so I get ticked in the box. Hey, Ewan was in church today. None of that. We go there because we found the one who satisfies. So when we sing songs like his name is the greatest, amen. We don't just say his name is the greatest. Or sometimes we're like, hey, you know what? The worship team is not singing my favorite song. It doesn't matter what song they're singing. It's all for his glory. Amen. And he's good. And if we find that pearl and we find that treasure, that's who we sing to. That's who we worship. And we put everything else on the altar because we found the great one. Amen. And if that's whom we seek this evening, then nothing else matters. Yeah. doesn't matter how people look at me. doesn't matter what people say about me. doesn't matter what I'm praying about. I found the one yeah. who satisfies. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for such an amazing moment where we can realize that everything we own is meaningless. Everything we have is because you've given it to us. So Father, my prayer for every single one of us in here this evening is not just about getting more stuff, but it's Lord for us who are seeking more of you. May you reveal yourself to us. For us who accidentally came in here, oh Lord, we've seen the glimmer of treasure. The hope is there. Father, I pray that you stir those hearts. That there be a move in this place and in this city that none of us can explain because you have sent us on mission. And because you have sent us on mission, oh Lord, may we understand that your kingdom has more value than anything we own. Amen. And if there is something else in the place of you, Father, I pray that you break those strongholds. I pray that you work in our individual hearts, that you may search us. And as you search us, O oh Lord, whatever it is that doesn't belong there, may it move. So I can make more room to advance your kingdom. So there can be more room for me to tell people about who you are. And I believe if this story had to go on, Lord, these people would have ran out telling people with great joy of the God they found. He's satisfied. He's changed me. He's transformed me. I was once broken, but now I'm whole. I was once poor, but now I'm rich. I was once blind, but now I see. 
Father, may that be the prayer of our hearts, that we found you. May we tell the world about this great God we found who satisfies, even though it may not look like the way I want it to look, Lord. It's still about you. Thank you, Father, for working in us and also using us to take your message forward to a world who's desperately seeking for you. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.